Hi everyone, I'm Josh and welcome to Josh Wright Piano TV. Thank you so much for joining me today. I'm happy you're here. Today I wanna to talk about how to make, make large leaps easier on the piano. So this is when you're jumping from one register to another on the piano. And it doesn't even have to be that big of a jump in order to be intimidating a lot of times. I want to go over physically how to make that jump easier along with kind of the psychological or mental processes that can make this easier as well. And those two are married together. It's not like this is what you do physically, this is what you do psychologically. I think this all is going to combine to make an easier experience for you. I have done some videos about jumps uh, in the past on my YouTube channel. You can go check those out for further information. I'll review a few of those concepts here. but. A few new things that I don't think I've covered on my channel. I was teaching my student uh, the other day. He lives in Canada. We were going over the Liszt Rhapsody number 13. Um, Very gorgeous uh, piece and at the end it's very exciting you can go watch especially Volados' recording of this it's crazy but there are these octaves that then leap these large distances how can we get those in tempo I do not play this piece and I haven't prepared this passage because I want it's very I think it's very discouraging on YouTube uh, when students see professional pianists or teachers only play polished material and they're like, oh, it's so easy, you just do this, but they've been working cra crazy hours behind the scenes to get it that way. And then I'll also demonstrate first with an example of a piece that I'm preparing for just this little mini concert I'm playing next week, the Chopin Third Scherzo. Everyone knows it for the uh, octaves. <laughs> to target this spot. How do we get that more accurate? Okay, so I'll first demonstrate with this since I know it, and then I'm going to jump into the list and kind of show you in real time applying those concepts. I'm probably not going to get this list example perfect in this tutorial, and that's all right because I, I don't want you to think that these things are fixed within five minutes. I remember this. Hopefully I can do this. Let's see. the end of La Campanella. That took me forever to get comfortable with those octave jumps. Those are so difficult. One of the main themes that I want to instill in each of you as you watch this video is that this will get better with time. No matter how um, long that might be, it does get better with time. So for some people, you might be able to get this very quickly. Sergei Babayan could probably master any of these in about 10 seconds. You know, I've, I've watched him struggle in lessons. That struggle ended in about, you know, under 30 seconds. But um, <laughs> for things that he didn't even play, it was amazing. Other students might take months. I remember I really... I really never f felt that confident with that until several months after learning that. I learned it as a late teen. Um, and now when I play it, I actually feel quite confident because I've played it so many times and my hand kind of knows those distances. Okay, so that's the first lesson that I want to instill in you is just time will make jumps better. You'll get more confident with them. So just keep persisting. That's the first piece of advice, but that's kind of lame advice. You didn't come here for that. Let's go over what you came for. So, um, Let's just take one hand at a time because it's easier to demonstrate. All right, so we're going from here. These are really not that intimidating of jumps. A few things that you can do with octaves in particular is practice just the thumbs. So I'm practicing that. And feeling kind of the limpness, kind of the turning of the thumb over. So. And then you can also do it with pinkies and fourth fingers. If you have big enough hands, I recommend doing fours on blacks. If you have tiny hands, you can do all fives. Um, there are certain instances in music where I suggest all fives anyway, um, just to keep the hand a little more compact, less stretched out. Um, but in this case, I think fours are very wise. Four, five, five, four, five, four. So you could do 
And these, this is harder than the thumb. Okay, wow, I'm surprised I got it the first try. See, it didn't get it the second. Okay, and you do that until that's comfortable. And already that's feeling better. So you can do that with chords as well. Chordal jumps, you can practice. I have a video on YouTube called the chord combo exercise. You can jot that down and watch that after this if you'd like. Um, it basically is going over, like if you were doing Mendelssohn serious variations, which is very jumpy. Okay, you could practice just the bottom notes of each chord, just the middle notes of each chord, just the top notes of each chord, just the bottom two, the outer ones, the top two, and if you're dealing with four note chords, you have even more combinations. That's why I call it the chord combo exercise. And then you can do uh, just the left hand with all those same things, and then you can do all sorts of combinations between the hands. If you exhaustively go through that list, you will feel so confident <laughs> with the passage if you work to perfection, even to a medium or medium fast tempo, not your full tempo. You'll still feel better when you go to full tempo if you've gone through every one of those. Ultimately, with jumps, it is very helpful to actually go faster than you're going to need at the end uh, for full tempo, in other words. So for this um, Chopin, I might practice that really quickly. Okay, and that will really help because, because then if I take ya tan tam, just like a little bit of expressive rubato. So, so. It makes it even easier, less intimidating. Okay, again, I've also played this piece for a really long time, so I feel fairly comfortable with it. I, I haven't played it for probably what is it, maybe eight years now. The last time I played it was for the National Chopin Competition in 2015. But it comes back really easily because I, I played it for many years pr previous to that. I found, this is another little just random tip for you, I found that the more you bring a piece back over the years, the more solid it feels each time you play it. So a piece that I never brought back, like Rachmaninoff Second Concerto, I learned that, played it for a performance, never came back to it. I could probably not even like sight read it for you. It's it's gone. Whereas this little Scarlatti Sonata. This is like still in my bones. Because I play, I learned it when I was like 11. And granted, it's easier than rock too as well. So maybe that has something to do with it. But the more you bring something back, I could probably prepare that for a performance. I wouldn't do this, but I probably could. Within about 15 or 20 minutes, I could I could feel ready to go with that. Rock 2, I would want, you know, many months. It's also much longer than that Scarlatti Sonata. However, the point still stands. Stuff that you continuously bring back. So don't look at my scherzo and say, why can he do that and he can't do this list? Or, uh, I'm really struggling with that scherzo. Why can Josh do it so easily? I've, I've worked on it for a really long time, okay? Now for the meat of the video. I know that was a long intro. What I want you to do after those initial exercises is let's think about this logically, okay? Human brains can do things in a sequence very quickly, okay? So this is directly from Logan Skelton at Michigan. He taught me this. It helped so much. So he said, I, I can't even demonstrate because I've never learned it, but the, the Brahms third sonata, um, he's it has these big jumps and he would say, you know, a student would go here and then they would kind of panic and sometimes they would miss that high chord and they would, uh, he's like, why are you missing that? And they're like, I kind of panic. And he's like, I watched their hands and they got a little shaky right before they went to take the chord. So you might be going and you might miss that each time. If you find one hand before the other, so for this big jump, I might find the left hand first, then the right hand. I asked Logan, I said, you know, how do you know which hand to find before the other? And he said, find the one that's right in front of your face. So uh, first, so I find that left hand because that's just, you know, right in my eye line. Then I'll find this. But I want to take it one step further because I've already gone over that on my channel before. Think of the easier interval for the jump. So for instance, that's the scary jump, F sharp up to E. Now you might be thinking, hey, that's a seventh that I'm jumping because I'm jumping from thumb to thumb. Or you might be thinking even crazier. You might be thinking, oh my gosh, that's almost two full octaves there. I'm jumping from there to there. Wow, that's an even bigger jump. 
I want you to take the easy jump. What's the easy jump? F sharp to E. Now, if I asked any of you to play four, one, four, one, four, one, someone who's never played piano in their life could do that within two seconds, okay? So all you're going to do is you're just gonna practice touching this key So you'll, you'll touch it, but you'll only play the top one, okay? And then you'll only, and if you happen to play it, no biggie. So, and we spot this, but we don't play it. And pretty soon you realize, hey, my hand knows what an octave feels like. And you can do this with any chordal things. I'm demonstrating with octaves today, but this works with chords. If, if you're playing chord, let's say you're playing this chord to this chord. You would do that little fourth right there. You wouldn't go there if you're just doing two c major chords you would go from there to there because that's just a fourth that's easy so and your hand knows what that chord feels like so very rapidly you can get these large jumps comfortable in your hands because you're looking at the smaller interval okay all right so that is the main piece of advice that i want to go over today is find your smallest interval okay so let's uh, still apply all that other stuff though. I know that was a long intro, finding one hand before the other, practicing different chord combinations, or if you're doing octaves, just thumbs, just tops. And then you could actually do combinations with octaves. You could do just thumbs in the left and you could do the full octaves in the right or vice versa, or just the top in the right, just the bottom in the right with full octaves in the left. So do all of those combinations. Let's go to the list, which I don't play, okay? So, okay, so what am I gonna think of there? I'm gonna prob. I mean, these are both pretty equidistant uh, because going from there to there is a fifth. This is actually a fourth. So actually thinking of that fourth or that fourth is actually equally beneficial here. Um, there's no obvious one because it's not like if you're going A to B flat, you would think of the second. Here, I'll just think of the fourths. But then I have this huge leap right there. Okay, so I'm just gonna think of the A to the B flat. So I'll go. You could even just spot the B flat. And then and you do that until that feels good. Okay, this one, same thing. You can just think of, those are small enough leaps. It's not a big deal. But going from there to there. Now you might be thinking, Josh, it's even easier to do that five to the two there because that's right next to it. And you could totally do that. I just find that going to a thumb really gives you a secure way of thinking. So I'd probably think of the A going to the D. So rather than thinking A all the way down to the D, I would think A, that A, up to that D. So, okay, now let's try this. Now we got to apply our strategy of which hand are we gonna play uh, find first. Okay, which one is a little closer? I kind of feel, because that's just a fourth, this is a fifth from there to there, this is, that's a lot harder, I feel like. So I'll probably find the left hand. Another strategy, another point that's very important. I don't want you to ignore this as a side note. This is <laughs> a principal note. Um, you have to, with large leaps, especially that are going opposite of each other, uh, opposite directions of each other, you have to choose to be blind in one hand. So often finding the blind hand first and then spotting the harder hand is a good strategy because it's hard to be blind uh, to that, right? But what it would be harder to be blind to that, right? Because I could watch that left hand, but... Also, this is my melody. If I missed the left hand, like if I missed the note and I went rather than something like that, it still doesn't sound good at all, but it sounds a lot better than, than that or something. So you want to strategically know where to look at the piano. So my strategy is find the blind hand first, find that left hand and just slide. I can feel that. I got it. And now I want to practice left, right. You 
could even go back and forth. No. For some reason, my left hand's feeling a little too jumpy now that it's blind. So another strategy that you can use is you can use a substitute fingering. Or it's not a substitute fingering, um, a connected fingering. So you could go. And you could spot. So I'm going to hold on to that A. I'm going to spot the D. Then I'll find the rest of my chord. So I'll go there, find the D. And then I'll find the rest of my chord. I'm doing this all blind. I'm looking at the camera. Okay, I'm finding my D. Okay. Okay. And the truth is, you don't need to go da 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 dum. It actually, in my opinion, hearkening back to this old Baroque idiom of of I can't remember where I read it. It was in some textbook when I was at school, but they said sometimes when you have larger leaps, you can stretch those larger leaps for an expressive effect. And I think that actually sounds better here. Okay, there's that. Or I actually think that sounds better with a little extra time. Yes, it shows the human limitations that that's hard, but yeah. Then you could go to the next chord, same way. Okay. So I think you do have a little bit of leeway. Okay. In order to not paint yourself into this comfortable corner of, oh, I've got a lot of time. And then slowly over several weeks, get even slower getting to that. Work that. So nice and loose. And then just spot those chords. And you could even do... Find those notes. So I hope this video uh, video has been helpful at making jumps easier in your piano studies. Think of that smallest distance along with all of the other advice that I gave you about jumps. Another one that's very obvious is to practice eyes closed. Okay, so that I'll leave you with that. If you found this video helpful, I would love it if you would subscribe to the channel. It helps and, and like the video and leave a comment down below. That helps the algorithm as much as we all hate that algorithm. Uh, it does help to spread this information to more people, which is why I make these videos. I want to help as many pianists as I can. Thank you for your support over the years. Uh, this channel continues to grow, and I'm just amazed at the outpouring of friendship and support that I receive. If you have any questions, my email is josh at joshwrightpiano.com. If you'd like to go even deeper than we cover, uh, than the concepts we cover on this channel, I do have some paid courses. You can click on the links in the description below to check those out. One of them is called Pro Practice. The other one is called the VIP Masterclass Series. So you can check out information by clicking those links. And finally, I have a link in the description of my gear kit. So all the gear, including the microphones, the lights, the cameras that I use to film these videos. I hope this has been helpful. Have a great week. Good luck in your practice sessions. Thank you.